Okay, so uh, last time we talked about some very particular representations, and today I want to talk about all of the representations at once. Uh, so usually, gamma will be pi 1 of m, where m is a finite volume oriented hyperbolic three manifold and often it will only make sense to have at least one cusp. So if you think of a hyperbolic knot complement, everything I say will be will be true. But a lot of the things I say will be true in much more generality. Um, but before we think about this, I want to talk about representations for just any gamma finitely presented. Um, so let's say my gamma has n generators. And m relations, uh, then I want to very concretely tell you what the, represent, the SL2C representation variety looks like. So this is a set of all representations rho from gamma to SL2C. Um, and there's a very concrete way to see that R gamma is a complex algebraic set. So showing you in terms of matrices, I think, will enable you to actually get a better feeling for what this object looks like. So let's uh, take a look at what happens to one of the generators. So um, right, for a representation row, what does it do? to the generator g little n? Well, it has to send it to a 2 by 2 matrix. So maybe a n, b n, c n, d n. And it's SL 2 C, so the determinant is 1. And the entries are complex, because it's SL 2 C. OK, so I could just randomly select A, B, C's, and D's that fulfill this condition for each G, but that's not going to make a representation. A representation has to be a homomorphism from gamma to SL2C. So in order to ensure it's well-defined, I need to make sure that any word that's trivial in gamma is trivial in terms of the matrices. So I need row of the relations. The relations, think of them just as a word in the generator, each relation. So row of Rm to equal the identity. And then this will ensure that my assignment here is a homomorphism. So what is this? This is a finite. matrix multiplication of matrices that look like this and their inverses. So that means I'll get four entries, and each of those entries is going to be a polynomial in the A, B, Cs, and Ds, maybe with some inverses uh, thrown in. Since it's in SL2C, we can actually get rid of having to consider inverses, but it doesn't matter. So this is determined by, well, I have big M relations, and I'll have four equations. So 4M polynomial equations. So 
in total, I have, uh, I have uh, four variables for each generator, so four n variables. And, well, I have one relation, one polynomial equation for each generator. So that'll be um, n of them. And then I have four polynomials for each relation. So if I counted right, I have that many equations. Okay? So. Um, our, our gamma, you can think of it as sitting inside C4n, and it's cut out by n plus 4m equations. So I make no claims that the equations are independent of one another, but if we use all of those equations, we'll be sure that our, our representation is well defined, and I haven't required any additional information. The normal subgroup generated by the rho GMs? I'm just talking about the actual functions that are the polynomials that are required to create the correct vanishing set. Uh, if you want to talk about um, the finer uh, like ring structure, then you might have to be a little more careful. The are when they're conjugates are also one. Okay. Um, okay, what was I going to say next? Okay, so this R, N, R gamma is usually not irreducible. So it's called the representation variety, but that's a little bit of a lie. It's SL2C representation variety. But usually the word variety is used for an irreducible set. Um, but the, this is the word that people use. So uh, to see that it's not irreducible, recall, I don't like using two different notions of the word irreducible in the span of 30 seconds, but it's unavoidable that a representation is reducible if it has an invariant one-dimensional subspace. And last time we talked about the, f the, the fact that that means your representation can be conjugated to be upper triangular. So it's reducible if it is conjugate to an upper triangular one. So let's just look at R, well, I'll call it R triangle gamma, the set of upper triangular representations. So that just means that everything goes to an upper triangular matrix. You know, whatever works, but the, what is it, 2, 1 entry has to be 0. So this is a subset of R gamma. And this doesn't exactly show that it's irreducible, but I want to eventually talk about characters. And the, rel the equivalent statement in terms of characters will be correct, but just note that the upper triangular representations is itself an algebraic set. Right? Because what am I doing? I'm 
the same calculation over here, but I'm just making c equal 0. So I can just think about using the same equations, but I'm going to just include the n equations saying all of the c little n's equal 0. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about the reducible representations. Uh, and then I'll forget that they exist after that. Uh, but first, let's just do a little example. Well, this doesn't technically tell you because we don't know what dimensions everything is. Um, but it's never reducible. You can elevate this to showing that the set of all um, reducible representations itself forms a sort of variety and you can decompose the full variety as reducible union well there's a risky closure of the irreducibles so you can always do that now for some groups like uh, Z which I'll show you everything is reducible but the key point will be if I use gamma to be the fundamental group of a hyperbolic not complement then I'll always get uh, irreducible representations because we know that the discrete faithful representation has to be irreducible. So uh, the things we're interested in have irreducible parts and then just this almost silly, I'm being very judgmental, but a, a part that's just the reducible parts. Okay, let's, let's just take a look at Z. Well, I'll think of Z as cyclic group generated by T, I guess. If you're very particular, we'll do that. So what do I need to do? I need to just figure out where rho of T goes. It's completely determined by that. And well, I have no idea, but it goes to some matrix A, B, C, D, where A, D minus B, C equals 1. And there's no other constraints because this is a free group on one generator. So if I solve for A, for example, for most representations, A won't be 0. And I can have three free variables then. So this is birational. There's a little bit to show, I suppose. But birational to just C3 itself. Okay, so as written, it's a subset of C4 with one equation. But that one equation just eliminates a variable, essentially. Um, oh, well, while we're at it, let's just do one more example. Let's look at the representations of Fn. The free group on n generators. OK, so if Fn just looks like T1 through Tn, then again, there are no relations to be satisfied. And I just need rho of Tn to be some generic matrix satisfying the determinant condition. So. This sits inside C4n, and it's cut out by the n equations that just specify the determinant as 1. So you can see then it just looks like um, C3 to the n. Okay. A finite group? Um, the most representations, I'm probably going to lie if I answer that question. <laughs> no, I'm not going to answer. Sorry. It's a good question, but I'm not going to answer. Many finite groups only have reducible representations. I'll say that much.
OK, so let's have a few words about reducible representations. OK, so since uh, they're all conjugate to uh, upper triangular matrices, I'm just going to think about upper triangular matrices. And the claim is, oh, I wanted to say this in a particular order. So rho you can show that rho is irreducible exactly when the trace of gamma equals 2 for all gamma in the commutator. So I'm going to just tell you about the easy direction of, of this proof. The other direction is a bit more involved and I don't think so illuminating for us. But um, just notice that if rho is irreducible, then everything up to, I need to tell you something about the trace. And the trace is invariant after conjugation. So I'll just assume I'm looking at my upper triangular conjugate. Then you can do an easy computation. So for uh, gamma in the commutator, Commutators are products of simple commutators, right? So actually, I only would have to show something for a simple commutator. Because if you're upper triangular and trace 2, then you have 1s on the diagonal. Okay, And then multiplying things with 1s on the diagonal has more 1s on the diagonal. The trace will be 2. So if I take a simple commutator, then you can write gamma as alpha, beta, alpha inverse, beta inverse. And if you get bored, you can check that if alpha and beta are upper triangular, literally just multiply them together. Whatever the upper triangular things you get, gamma is always going to look like 1, who knows what, 0, 1. Okay, so it doesn't matter. Just write a generic upper triangular matrix for a row of each of these. Multiply together for this. You'll always get uh, this parabolic matrix there. Okay, so this actually um, is a way to see that the reducible representations form uh, their own component because trace can be formulated in terms of a polynomial equation. Um, so the other interesting thing about the reducible representations are uh, if rho is reducible, then the trace of rho I might as well introduce characters at some point. So I'll tell you what this means in a second. The trace functions associated to rho is the same as the trace function associated to rho prime, where rho prime is abelian. If I say a representation is something, I mean the group rho prime of gamma has this property. So rho prime of gamma is an abelian subgroup of the matrices. So chi rho is a character function. So goes from the original group into C. And if I take a group element gamma, chi rho of gamma is just the trace of the matrix you get out from the representation. So what this is saying is if rho is reducible, then it looks a lot like an abelian representation. And you can actually be precise let's say um, 
So up to conjugation, rho is upper triangular. And if, let's say, on a generator, gn, rho of gn looks like a n, b n, 0. I wrote d n before, but if it's determinant of 1, we might as well write a n inverse. Then the abelian cousin, rho prime, well, I can always define this rule of assignment. I'm just going to erase b n make it zero. But the claim is that if you do that, then you actually get a representation. So you have to do a little check. It's, it's whatever, whatever number this is for rho. I'm using the same a n. So maybe I'll say it again and it'll be more clear. I'm saying if rho happens to be uh, an irreducible representation, then there exists an abelian representation that every entry in the group has the same trace as the row representation. So I make no claims as to what uh, you know, rho of gamma as a group looks like compared to rho prime of gamma. I'm just saying that the, they look the same uh, in terms of their trace functions. Um, so you can say, uh, I want to say one more uh, interesting fact about the reducible representations. Because we know that the commutator would have trace 1, so if I have a reducible representation, I can assume that it's upper triangular. And the commutator has trace 1, which means the commutator subgroup is in this Borel subgroup. But if you multiply any two matrices, upper triangular matrices, with uh, ones on the diagonal, they commute. So this claim tells us that the commutator will have to commute. So I have uh, any reducible representation necessarily has an abelian commutator. And there's a name for groups like that. They're called metabelian. Oh, I, don't know. I wish someone had, I'm sure I'll do this again. Reducible, reducible. It's definitely not true for you, reduce. Yeah. So, thank you. The first claim tells us that the commutator subgroup is abelian. And this implies that if rho is reducible, <laughs> then either rho of gamma is abelian or metabelian. So I want to state a result just, please don't ask me any real questions about this result, uh, just to show you that uh, studying these actually ties into some other things that you've uh, heard about over the week. So I think it was 
1967. So I think I believe independently, Bertie and Dharam showed that um, there exists a truly metabelian representation uh, row from. Gamma to SL two C define of the form it looks almost abelian, and then you just multiply it by a uh, by a parabolic. Uh, if and only if this lambda corresponds to a root of the Alexander polynomial. I should say uh, this is for a not complement group. Okay, so this is a very particular form, and here. Uh, this phi is, I think, I forgot to write it down. I think it's the linking number. No, it can't be that. If I wasn't at the board, I could tell you precisely what it is. Uh, it just has to do with you, you know that the um, meridian uh, is going to go to actually lambda. And then it uh, basically involves how many powers of the meridian you need to write it as a word. But I don't want to write something down that's not quite right, so uh, I'll just write it like that. Okay. Um, usually when people think of, so these aren't in general going to be parabolic because when you multiply it out, then your trace will be, uh, won't be too so usually when people are looking for parabolic representations, because if they're reducible, it basically looks a lot like the trivial representation, uh, they're usually looking for irreducible parabolic representations, which we know we have the discrete faithful representation, which is parabolic. So it usually means the meridian goes to a trace 2 or negative 2. So we know a discrete faithful representation has that property. And the question is, can you find other ones? There can only be a finite number for a not complement. Be otherwise, just due to algebraic geometry nonsense, there'd have to be, well, everything essentially would have to be parabolic. So, OK. So I want to think of the representation variety as an invariant of a knot or a manifold in general, but we have a small problem, which is that I could write the fundamental group of the figure eight knot one way, and you could write it another way. And obviously, we're going to get different varieties. So, what happens if two groups are isomorphic? When I claim. that their varieties have to be isomorphic too. So let's just talk a little bit about how that would happen. OK, so R gamma 1, let's say gamma 1 is generated by Gs with relations Rs, and gamma 2 is generated by everything's with primes. I'm not assuming they have the same number of generators or anything like that. 
then I need an invertible polynomial relationship going one way and the other way, right? So I would need to know where to send, uh, essentially where to send gn, right? What is this variety cut out by? This variety is cut out by, well, rho gn. Really, I need the an, bn, cn's, and dn's. Okay, so how do I see these over on this side? Well, gn is some word in the uh, gi primes, right? So that means that this matrix is a product of the matrices for the primed things. Okay, so row of gn is a matrix with entries. All right, sorry, let me say if uh, the same representation, I, I send I send a group element to the, or an element of my fundamental group to the same spot, just under different isomorphisms of the group, think about it. So I just need some notation if GI prime is everything with primes. Then if I take all of the words that I need to write out GN, all the prime words, then this row of GN better be a product of the primed matrices corresponding to those words. So uh, all the entries, the an entry is going to be a product of the primed variables. So this, ma this matrix will be a matrix with entries of the type that. Okay, so I'll just send my variable an to the appropriate polynomial that corresponds to an. And same with bn, same with cn, same to dn. Then I get a map one way, but I can do the same thing the other direction. I can write g1 prime as a1 prime, b1 prime, and so on. And over here, I'll just write g1 prime as a product of the g's without the primes. And so every a1 prime, for example, can be associated to a polynomial in the a n, b n, c n's, and d n's. So in this way, I got a polynomial map this way, a polynomial map this way, and they're inverses of one another. So this gives me this uh, isomorphism. So I'm sorry I didn't write more down, but to actually write it correctly takes up a lot of needless chalk. Sorry? Well, yeah, I mean, you need to, um, you just need to associate the same generic row to each side, right? So, you know, any row in using this sort of model for the character variety, some row goes to uh, A and B and C and D N. And those values, the actual, like, uh, if you tell me the discrete faithful representation, there is a complex number corresponding to a n, right? But uh, if you think abstractly, any row uh, determines these, is, is uh, defined in terms of the variables. So think of the a's, b's, c's, d's and, as variables. And a row has to be written in terms of, a row is the solution to the polynomials that come from the relations written in terms of the A, B, C's, and D's. So what we're doing is we're just saying that the A variable that corresponds to where any row sends, the one one entry of where any row sends G in, if I think of this element of the group under the isomorphism over here, then this element is a word in the primed generators. And where does a representation send the prime generators? Well, I can write it in terms of uh, matrix multiplication with these variables. So I get an exact association 
A1 is exactly equivalent to, uh, for example, if, uh, let's just say G1 equals G2 inverse G3, then A1, B1, C1, D1 better equal uh, A2, B2, C2, D2 inverse Right? And this is what? So So I get that A1 equals D2 A3 minus B2 C3. So this map will send A1. Sorry, these are primes. A1 will go to D2 prime A3 prime minus B2 prime C3 prime. And then I can do it for all of the other entries of this matrix. And the important thing is there was no, I randomly put gamma 1 on the left. Switching the roles, I can get an association on the right. OK, so we're mostly interested in topology. So if I took, say, the discrete faithful representation and a conjugate of it, then they have the same, they give me something with the same geometry. Because H3 mod gamma and H3 mod G gamma G inverse are geometrically identical. You know, if gamma is a discrete subgroup, then the manifolds are isometric. So these are geometrically the same. So why am I bothering with all the representations? I really want to mod out by conjugation. But I also would really like to still be able to do algebraic geometry. So as a compromise, the, the best we can really do is to essentially mod out by conjugation. So to solve this, I'm going to look at the characters instead, those trace functions. Because if two representations are conjugate, I have the same traces. So x gamma, I'll just look at the set of character functions. Of the representations. And to state it as a fact, so what I'm going to write down is that if you're an irreducible representation, it's, it's exactly looking at a con your conjugacy class. So it's exactly modding out by conjugation. The only loss we have is that there's more collapsing for reducible representations. But we just saw that we have a pretty good grasp of those. OK, so if rho is irreducible, and I get the same exact function as a rho prime. So I just want to be clear, this means that the trace of the representation of gamma is the same for every element then rho prime is also irreducible. I guess I could have not said that. Uh, and rho and rho prime are conjugate. OK, 
Okay, so again, uh, representations being conjugate just means whatever row is, I take the matrix and there's a fixed uh, element of SL2C and to get row prime, I just conjugate every row matrix by that one. All right. So now we see that looking at the character variety maintains, gives us all the geometry, but none of the redundancy of the representation variety. So a few facts. This is also an algebraic set, I should say. Complex algebraic set, meaning the varieties are complex parameters. And I didn't say, but in the defining of the representation variety, we could write all of the equations with integer coefficients. So uh, you can do the same thing here. All the defining equations can be defined over z. Um, it's usually reducible. So if m is s3 minus k and gamma is pi 1 of m, then in particular you can write I'm, I'm, what I wrote down on the board is slightly misleading, so let me tell you what I mean by this. This consists of characters of reducible representations. which we know are the same as saying characters of abelian representations. And this technically I have to take the Zariski closure of characters of irreducible representations. That's right. So uh, I'm saying that you can write this as an algebra, you can consider it as an algebraic set, uh, cut out by finite number of variables with a finite number of constraint equations. And those constraint equations can be written with integer coefficients. Uh, I don't have time right now, but uh, if I can do an explicit example in the uh, problem session, we, we can do the figure eight so you can exactly see. Uh, I didn't say that. So, whoop, slippery. So, if this is a not complement, then all abelian, uh, so a not complement abelianization is Z. So, this is one component then uh, because it just looks like the character variety of Z. Uh, and this, I'll talk about that. It's not always irreducible. Um, so you can define so if you fix an element in your fundamental group gamma then you can define the function I gamma this looks very similar to the trace function it's the same idea but a different domain I take a representation row and I read off its trace and just to convince you in the abstract that it's an algebraic set, um, the I gammas generate, well, let me say this correctly, uh, yeah, generate the coordinate ring.
So the coordinate ring is basically the uh, functions up to the, the polynomial functions on your variety up to equivalence, meaning if two functions look identical on your variety, but maybe different outside of it, we consider them the same. Okay, so the character variety is the representations up to equivalence by trace, and this function exactly follows that definition. But I can do an example in the problem session of very concrete, you can see how it's a variety, and so you can see how you could actually um, get your hands on it. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the uh, sort of more topological uh, properties of this. So we know it's an algebraic set. Uh, if we're thinking of a not complement, we know exactly what the reducible representations look like. Uh, so what about the other piece of it? So putting on our algebraic geometry hats, the most basic questions are, how many irreducible pieces are we looking at? What are their dimensions? You know, we might get a little more subtle, but this is actually uh, more than we can answer. So let's, let's uh, start there. So we have uh, a few favorite representations, right? And if your favorite representation is the trivial one, then do not say it. All right, uh, I'm thinking of gamma being a fundamental group of something like a not complement. So I know I have a few discrete faithful representations. Right, so we have a few favorite components. So we call an irreducible component of the character variety a canonical component. I should be clear. Um, this, de this definition only applies to the case when I'm looking at the fundamental group of a hyperbolic manifold. And the notation, the common notation is slightly misleading. We write those components as gamma naught. There could be more than one though. If Chi rho naught, oops, I meant gamma. If chi rho naught is in there, where rho naught is discrete and faithful. Okay, a component that contains a character of the discrete, a discrete and faithful representation. So the one that corresponds to the complete hyperbolic structure. So if uh, M is a not complement, there's just one. If you have a more uh, eccentric manifold, uh, the lifting issue means that you could get more than one component. Okay, but we'll be simple people. Just think of not complements. Okay, so there's one very special component that has the character of uh, the representation corresponding to the complete hyperbolic structure. And Thurston showed uh, that all but finitely many. of the Dane filling representations or characters are on canonical components. Now, if I'm talking about a, something with more than one cusp, you have to be careful about exactly what you're saying. I'm just going to fill one cusp. I'm not filling them all at once. But for a not complement, the figure eight, then we could fill the cusp. Uh, we had a rational numbers, union, infinity, different types of ways we could do it. And all but a finite number of them 
are on the unique canonical component that we have in our character variety. Okay. No, it's the image of R gamma essentially under the uh, modulo conjugation map. That's what the functions look like. They look like the, the I gamma functions. I'll give you a concrete example where you can just see the functions. It's much, it's much easier. But those are what the functions look like. They look like the, you're just evaluating traces of representations. Um, OK, so, so we know a little bit about where some other characters sit. So we don't know in general if I just give you an x gamma, and we look at the irreducible part. I don't, in general, know how big anything is or how many things I have. But I do know, again by Thurston, and this is from the gluing equations that Abhijit was talking about, that the complex dimension is the number of cusps of m. Because when you're doing the tetrahedral gluing, you can think of it as a degrees of freedom uh, calculation. And for each cusp, you get a degree of freedom for your gluing equations. Um, OK, so what about other components? So not very much is known. Most of the things that are known are some special ways that you can often find manifolds that have another component. So there are two. I think I disagree with uh, Stefan. From my point of view, there are two tricks in terms of just simple algebra that sometimes get you an extra component. Uh, and they're slightly different than his tricks. The one you've already seen, so we already saw that if gamma 1 surge x gamma 2, then let's call this surjection pi. If I had a representation rho of gamma 2 to SL2C, then I get a representation of gamma 1 to SL2C. So that means. And because it's a surjection, I don't just get a map between them. I get an inclusion between them. OK, so this is what tells us that I'm going to write m. Like I said, if I take a different presentation, it's well defined up to isomorphism. So I get this filled manifolds character variety sitting in the original manifold's character variety as a result. So by Thurston's theorem, if m is a not complement, then its canonical component is a curve. And inside this curve, I have a bunch of points. Because by Thurston, the canonical component of this is a, is a, a set of dimension 0. So for the figure 8, uh, if I was going to be an algebraic geometer, The, there's a curve that's the, it only has one component. And on this curve are lots of uh, the filling points. If you're a topologist, the same exact scenario, I happen to know what the curve looks like. Looks like this, because a complex dimension 1 means real dimension 2. But dimension 0 is dimension 0 is dimension 0. And then there are a bunch of points on it. OK, so what's the second one? The second one is if the second useful one is if gamma 1 injects in gamma 2, then any representation rho gives a representation by, um, well, here, right? I can just take gamma 1, it injects, and I this is the restriction variety. 
this is not as obvious, but you still get, uh, well, you still get a map like this. And in many cases, uh, maybe not in many cases, sometimes, uh, this is, sometimes this is nice. I'll tell you exactly what I mean. So we want to know if there are other components. So the injection, let me make sure I get the citation right. There are several papers that have similar, similar results about getting lots of components. But Boyer, Luft, and Zhang use injections coming from cyclic covers. And in that case, they show that these maps are actually uh, degree one. So it's a proper injection of the character variety to show examples of M with arbitrarily, not that there is a manifold that has arbitrarily many components, but there are, for an arbitrary number, they'll provide a manifold whose character variety has that many components. Of Okay, I hope that that makes sense. And the first way with the surjections, um, there's a paper by Suki, Riley, and Sukuma that use uh, surjections of two bridge knots. to get the same thing, so to get M um, with many components. OK, so you can get lots of components that way. I know I'm, I have like two minutes, so let me uh, just tell you a few more things you can do. And morally, when I'm done, that will basically exhaust our knowledge of what any of these extra components look like. So they're very mysterious, um, a lot of them. And it's not at all clear if I give you a manifold, a not complement, how many components you should expect. OK, uh, so we've used, we've used these. Um, how about components with a sort of abnormally large dimension? Right? The dimension of the canonical component is fixed. So uh, I might have an extra name here, but it, that can't hurt, right? Some subset of these uh, showed that for M hyperbolic, uh, that the dimension of any component can't be too small. So if you have a not complement, if it's hyperbolic, you can't have any just points lying around there. Um, but you can get high dimensional components. I had a citation, but I'd take too long to find it. So I'll just give you a generic way that this might happen. If uh, you have a manifold whose fundamental group surjects the free group, we did the calculation for the representation variety of the free group, right? Roughly it had dimension, what, 3 times n? And the map to the character variety is, is uh, dimension killing, kills three dimensions or a third of the, 
the dimension is, is three to one, <laughs> I'll say it that way. So uh, the dimension of this is three times n minus one. So you get components of dimension, that's right. I'll say about 3n, then I'm not lying. So this is a way you can get things that are arbitrarily large. So the theme is that if you know some related manifold or related group, that often supplies you with extra components. Uh, and the, let me just make sure, I didn't want to say anything else. Okay, and then there, there's one other way that often allows you to realize that you have extra components um, and you can see this in various ways so since time is out I'll, I'll just give you one way if your manifold has a symmetry phi from m to m like uh, there's a strong involution of a lot of of a lot of knots uh, which actually is going to be the trivial example of this. It does nothing, but then phi induces <coughs> a symmetry on the representations. So what's it going to do to rho? Well, it's going to give you a new representation, rho phi. And what is that new representation? Well, where should the new representation take gamma? It should take gamma wherever the old representation took phi of gamma. And because any symmetry on the canonical component is going to basically preserve distances, then this symmetry for a discrete faithful representation essentially can't do anything on the character variety. And the same thing is true for the Dane fillings, that wherever a loop goes, it has to go to a loop of the, you know, geodesic goes to a geodesic of the same distance. So the canonical component, you can associate it in a precise way with a, you know, fixed point set of this action. And so if you know there's something that's not, often this forces something not to be fixed. Okay, so you can also realize this uh, as there are representations that factor through the quotient orbifold that you can make by m mod the symmetries. And if there are any representations that don't factor through, then they necessarily have to be not on the canonical component. So if there are any representations that don't factor through this orbifold where you take m mod the symmetry, then you get an extra component. So So now I hope you have some understanding of what the whole character variety looks like. Uh, if people want, I can show you how explicitly how to compute it for the figure eight. We can, you can see it very concretely, and then you can understand how you, you know, could work an example in general, although the way I'll show you probably not the exact way you'd want to generalize. Uh, and then tomorrow I'm going to talk about the A polynomial, which is very similar. So morally, the A polynomial, it actually looks exactly like the canonical component. The other parts of it might not truly be an exact match to the character variety. And then I'll attempt to tell you what the AJ conjecture is about. Um, I should say one more thing. The, the character variety is uh, proven super useful for, uh, I think it first might have come to fame when Color and Shalin showed how you can use uh, it to find surfaces in your manifold. 
Uh, so there, it has a lot of utility that's completely outside of anything that I've, that I've mentioned. Um, so that's it for today.